How's it going? Much to my dismay, it's still winter. And I was outside, just looking at the icicles everywhere, watching them melt, praying that spring will hurry up and come, when I had an idea. What if I could take those icicles and make a funky pattern? So today, we're gonna do that. Now this is really an excuse to test out an idea I have for a different type of linear rail. It's gonna be somewhere in between my plasma cutter and my camera arm. On my plasma cutter, I've just got a piece of flat bar and some V-groove bearings. These are stationary and these bottom ones are spring-loaded. That works pretty good until it falls off, and then it's a nightmare to get it back on. The linear rails on my camera arm are just a tube with bearings riding on it. And that works all right. There is absolutely no way that this is gonna fall off. The problem, a bit sloppy. So I got an idea for a rail somewhere in between these two homemade rails. I'll show you. This new linear rail is gonna use some one inch solid stock. This is about three bucks a foot and some V groove bearings. I got a pack of 14 on Amazon for like $15. So more cost effective than uh, other options and we can make it any length we want. I think for our bearing block, we're gonna use this two inch square tube. We can put this in diagonally and have just enough space from each corner to where we don't have to worry about it racking, but it's close enough that we can reach it with the bearings. That's as far as I've gotten in my head on this. The rest, well, we're winging it. Don't mind that terrible leak in the background. That's something I should fix, but I'm not fixing because I wanna move this thing out into the shed. So, you know, uh, sorry. But here's how I'm gonna cut the notches into my tube. I got this program that I can run. That gives us a little two inch rectangle. Then I can take my piece of square tube and just stick it in there. Then I can run the next program. Woo! It's hot, but I did some center spots where we can drill holes and cut notches that we can stick the bearings in. Now we just gotta do that on three sides of this and then I can turn off this frickin' air compressor. Ta-da! So here's our part. I went ahead and drilled out all those center spots and I've cut these on three, not that one, three sides. So now we need some number 10 bolts sticking out of all these little holes. I've gone ahead and ground down the heads of some socket cap screws because of um, interference issues. And these just go in here, just like that. And I'll hold them in place with one little tack. Ah, look at that! I can film it after all! That's some James Cameron shit right there, man. So now, we've got a bit of a metal porcupine. Now we just gotta make the part that will hold the bearing. So here, we have a whole bunch of shafts. I'm really hoping a press fit will work here. Otherwise, we got a lot of machining to do. Let's give it a whack! Oh my, it bet. Maybe this is too heavy of a press fit. Try one more. I'm gonna lube it up real good this time. See if that makes a difference. Nope. Dang, I guess we gotta try something else. Okay, I've taken this and I've stuck it in the drill and ground it down a bit. And now there's a bit of a taper on there. So. All right. Look at that! Oh, but it's chunky. Not easy to move. Wow, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> uh, I know I keep saying last try, but this time I've taken just a hair off on the lathe. Beautiful! See, we were just one hair too big and it still spins good. Nice. Ah, I say nice. That means I have to machine every single one of these, which is what I was trying to avoid by press fitting. So, um, eh, you know, it's okay. <laughs> I'll be back with all these bearings installed. Next, I just have to grind a flat spot on both sides of this shaft. Like so. Then we can drill a hole in the flat spot of the shaft. Just like that. So now, all of these guys have holes drilled into the flat spots. These install on the tube, like so. And all of these 
Get a lock nut. So I've tightened the nuts on these top ones and kind of just eyeballed them into alignment. Now I can go to the other side, stick in my one inch, and then install my bearings on this side. And then I just got to do the same on our third side. All right, it's in. Now I just have to adjust this until it's sliding pretty nicely. I'll be back once I get it. I'm back. So adjusting this takes some time, but once it's adjusted, I shouldn't have to do anything else. I got it. This all runs pretty dang smooth and it's tight on there. Like I can't wobble this. Let's install this on our large rail. Ta-da! Just like that. Lord! Well, hey, that little oopsie demonstrated that this thing ain't coming off. Ah, just like that, we've got a 12 foot long linear rail for less than a hundred dollars. That's pretty good. Whee! Now, this thing is gonna be mounted on the roof. So, we need a way to mount it. So here, we have a piece of angle with some holes drilled in it. That goes right there. Same thing on the other side. To drive our carriage back and forth, a stepper motor that I left in the rain. Are you guys ready for the most half-ass belt tensioner you've ever seen? Number 10 screw, idle or pulley. Another number 10 screw. Another number 10 screw. Drill two holes. Insert thingy and put nuts on the back side. So now we can tension the belt by tightening these nuts on the back. Simple. Now then to fasten the belt to our gantry, got a couple little pieces of one inch flat bar with holes drilled in them. The holes are gonna get some quarter inch bolts. I'll weld those in place and then weld them to the bottom of the gantry. These each get a plate and a wing nut. Then I can take my belt, stick it in there, tighten up the wing nut, pull it over this way, loop it around the motor, go all the way to the other side, stick it through our idler, and stick it into our other belt catcher thingy. And then we tension our belt up with our super simple, easy peasy belt tensioner system. Trademark. Actually, I think this is one of those things you don't want the trademark for. That's just embarrassing. So now, spin motor. Gantry move. Easy peasy. We need this thing to be dripping water on the roof. So, I got some spaghetti. This is just drip irrigation stuff, and I've got a two gallon per hour emitter on the end, so we won't be wasting a ton of water doing this. Now, I also got pipe wrap and a heat cable. So, I'm gonna start on the end here and do heat cable with insulation over it all the way down this piece. Now I need a piece that's long enough to reach across the entire thing, so maybe I should figure that out first. Take all our bits here and just wrap them up. I gotta do that all the way down this thing, so wish me luck. All right, got this thing all wrapped up. Now, the other end, wait a minute. The other end goes into a solenoid valve. This will also be heat taped and wrapped. Beautiful. Looks like just as good of a job as any plumber would have done. I'll continue to wrap this all the way down to the hose spigot. I'm not gonna do that quite yet. I wanna use the heat tape as efficiently as possible and I won't know how to do that until I'm outside with it. So, last thing we gotta do is attach our little emitter to our gantry. The best I got for that, it'll do. Done. We're getting somewhere with this. Before taking this outside and mounting it, I want to get the electronics done. So, here's a cute little animation. Animation? I don't think so. That's a lot of work for this simple machine. I think you can imagine how the machine works and I'll explain it to you in the next clip. The part that needs a little bit more explanation is 
the graphing function. I went full nerd on this and thought, wouldn't it be cool to be able to plug a function in and then the machine graphs it in icicles? That's the kind of stuff that I think is cool, I guess. So let me show you that. In the code, we have this graph function here. And within that function is a function. This is a function to make a sine wave. The B sets the frequency. The A sets the amplitude. The plus A is just to translate the whole graph up so this spits out positive values. And then we multiply that by 1000 because we're dealing with microseconds here and return that number. In the loop, we set the direction, we move six inches, and then we turn on the relay, which turns on the solenoid valve for whatever amount of time that function spits out. So you can see each time we're feeding a different value for X in that function. And it just repeats this over and over again. So hopefully we'll be able to graph a sine wave using icicles. That's cool, right? Yeah, I know I'm a big nerd. Everything seems to be working. When we first start it up, it goes to the home position, which is this little button that I stuck in a washer. And then once it's homed, it moves six inches and then lets water out for an amount of time based on our function. Oh, and once it gets to the end, it unhomes itself and starts heading back to the home position. That way it's getting homed on every cycle so we won't get out of sync because of some kind of belt skips or whatever. But yeah, to the roof. Oh my, what a mess. Now you may be asking, how am I gonna keep this out of the weather? Well, here I have a bucket and here I have a sawzall. Bam! Not janky at all. Also, not a sponsor. Here goes nothing. So all our gantry's moving back. Moment of truth. Yeah! As you can see, it moves six inches and then turns on the water for a set amount of time. I think this is gonna work. Gotta wait for it to get below freezing. Well, I come to you on this messy workbench to discuss a problem. I realistically have one more night to get this right. So I thought now's a good time to discuss problem solving. So this is my method of problem solving 101. There are three factors that we need to take into account before even thinking about a solution. One, understand the problem. So my problem is Icicles do not form. Thing number two, I need to fully understand the tools I have available to me. Tools I have are flow rate, I can adjust that. Forming point, I can decide where they're gonna form. Start time, I can decide at what time to start the machine. Water temperature, I can figure out the temperature of the water as it comes out of the emitter. That might be critical now that I'm thinking of it. With the third important thing to understand, which is, what's the word? Limitations. So the one glaring limitation, is I can't control how cold it gets at night. Another thing worth taking into account here is time limitations. I can only do this at night. And this brings me to a new tool that I have, which is insomnia. Anyway, this is not the most comprehensive list I've ever made, but this is also not the biggest problem I've had to solve. So this'll do. So next you take all these parameters then you stick all of these parameters into your head and let them stew throughout the day. Keeping them in mind while doing further research on the problem is helpful, but I find that my solutions come to me in random places. So just keep them in your head and something will fall out. Keep those parameters stewing in your head until you have a nice, delicious solution stew. If that stew doesn't work to fix the problem, you need to adjust your ingredients. I'll go back to the beginning and rethink my inputs and make sure I'm fully understanding each of them. This actually looks kind of delicious. I think I'm gonna pick the wood out and eat it. Waste not, want not. So, what's the solution I came to? Well, one of them was handed to me on a silver platter. 
Tonight is going to be significantly colder than the last two nights that I tried this, so hallelujah. <laughs> the other solutions, this last little run of spaghetti I have taken out of the insulation because I noticed that a heating coil gets pretty hot, like hotter than 32 degrees for sure. It feels hot to my hand. So I'm hoping from here to here is enough time to cool it down enough to where it doesn't have to do its cooling in this, you know, three inch space, but not long enough for it to freeze. Fingers freaking cross. The next thing I did is I messed with these finish nails to where they're all exactly underneath where the water is dripping. And I'm gonna put an icicle on each of them as somewhat of a starting point for the icicles to form. And the final little tidbit I have, here it is. Check it out guys, this is the interior of the shed now. It's very uh, little girl's room, huh? The last thing I got is this smart switch. If you guys didn't notice, I'm a bit of a nerd. So I have Home Assistant running on my server, which is a thing that you can use to make automations with smart devices. I'm gonna integrate this smart plug and then set an automation in Home Assistant to where when the temperature drops below freezing, this turns on. That's just redundancy. I'm also gonna stay up, but you know, redundant systems are good systems. Without further ado though, let's do this thing. Good morning. Let's take a little look-see at what we got. Oh, you know what? It's not too bad. You know, I'm uh, pleasantly surprised. Ooh. I'm gonna go get some coffee and we can talk about this. Oh no. Got my coffee. Well, it didn't work great, but it did work better. So we got that going for us. Now looking at the forecast from here on out, last night was my last chance to do this and the pattern isn't the most clear in the world. I think it's a fair time to call this good enough. It wasn't all for nothing. That linear rail really knocked it out of the park. I had that thing running all night, multiple nights in the cold and it didn't even jam up once. Pretty good. I'm definitely using that rail on my plasma cutter. Now as for the point of this, well, I feel like you'd see the point if it worked well. It didn't work well. So I guess now I'm just out here looking kind of silly, but that's okay. <laughs> that's what I'm here for. Hey, either way, if you like what you saw, leave a good old dinger. Think about subscribing and thank you for watching.